Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'm very pleased uh, to welcome Dave Lindbergh to MSR this morning. It's an opportunistic uh, uh, talk. He's on vacation. We nav managed to snag him as he was wandering by. Uh, Dave is uh, uh, at Hook Laboratories at the moment, and he leads uh, the development there of scientific uh, instruments for biologists. Um, in a previous life, uh, recently, he was director of standardization for Polycom, and then before that, Picture Tell for many years, going back to the 90s. Uh, he's got books on multimedia compression and contrib contributions to books on multimedia compression. Uh, I first heard him give a keynote at the 2004 um, Picture Coding Symposium, or was it Packet, uh, video. Packet video Workshop, uh, which is one of the best keynotes I've ever heard. So uh, I'm confident he'll give a really nice talk uh, here today. Uh, so let's, uh, let's welcome Dave Lindbergh. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, this is a distant, this talk is a distant descendant of that same keynote from Packet Video 2004, although it's been updated a bit. So I wanted to just start by saying thanks to Phil and to Rico, uh, Rico Malvar, who's not here. I think he's down in LA today for inviting me. Um, as I was saying before we got started, I'm always happy to express my opinions. I'm an opinionated guy and uh, always happy to dump them on an interested audience who wants to hear. You may not agree, but I hope at least you'll find it interesting. Uh, I already covered that. I got a laser pointer, so I'm all set. Uh, yeah, it works. OK, so a little bit about me. Um, besides what Phil just told you, I, I was indeed uh, with PictureTel and then Polycom in the video conferencing industry from 93 to 2006. That was 14 years. In fact, Rico hired me into PictureTel in 94, I was a consultant for like a year before that. Um, so I spent 14 years in the video telecommunications industry, which is way too much. And by the end, I was really sick of it. Um, and some of the reasons why I was sick, is it, sick of it, I'm going to talk about. Um, I, I presented this talk while I was at Polycom a number of times to different people, to potential partners and people who were going to do technical stuff or might have. Um, and I said that this was the kind of stuff that Polycom was interested in and that this was kind of our vision of the future. Uh, that was an optimistic lie. That wasn't true. Nobody was interested in this stuff except me. I was trying to get Polycom interested. <laughs> I was able to get some senior management people to at least let me say that we were interested in it. But we weren't really. Um, and my experience has been not just in Polycom, but in a lot of companies, established firms that are doing well very rarely really innovate. What they do is they tweak what they already have. They, they add bells and whistles on and make things a little better. They follow the competition, try to get a little ahead maybe. But unless they're desperate, unless things are really going wrong, they very rarely really innovate. And that was certainly the case with Polycom. And I don't work for them anymore for like five years, so I don't care whether they like that or not. I'm sorry. Um, maybe things have changed there. I hope so. So at any rate, this doesn't apply anymore. I have no vested interest in optimism. I am out of the interest, <laughs> out of the industry, and I can say what I really think. So that's what I'm going to do today. Um, so as Phil was saying, the first version of this was the keynote for Packet Video 2004. Uh, it has been modified since then. It, it was really the version you're going to hear today is really aimed mostly at people already in the video telecom industry, uh, trying to persuade them to broaden their horizons a little bit. Um, but except for a brief warming over last night, this version is from 2008. And certainly some things have changed since then. Some of the numbers have changed a little. I don't think anything really fundamental has changed. Um, now, it's 2011 now. And I know a lot of people are going to immediately start and saying, hey, what are you talking about? Video phones are failing, and they don't work. My cell phone does video. My iPhone does video, my this or that. Uh, I have a webcam, I have Skype, I use it. I talk to my relatives in another country. I talk to my children who are at college. Yeah, those are, those are niche applications, and those certainly are happening, and they were already happening in 2008, although they're more common now. 
Um, but the question I would ask is, what proportion of your calls actually use video? Of all your calls, every time you pick up the phone, how many times do you use video? I'm not asking whether you have the capability. Do you use it? Okay, and I think the answer is no, 95 plus percent of the time. And I think this is a state of affairs that 20 years ago, nobody in the industry would have believed was going to be the case. The idea was that video calls, video telephony, was going to replace voice telephony. And that certainly hasn't happened yet. So very briefly, um, I'm going to talk about Hook Labs, what I'm doing now, and how we use video there, how we got to this point, the history, uh, where the successful niches are, why there has been no mass market adoption of video telephony, uh, what some of the reasons sometimes offered but are wrong are, and what the right answers are, in my opinion, and, and then I'll propose some things to do about it in a vague, hand-wavy, half-baked kind of way. Um, so my thesis, again, this is from 2008. Video telecommunications is in less than 1% of conference rooms. And again, this talk is oriented toward the video conferencing industry. But from their point of view, you know, almost every company all over the world, every organization, not just companies, has a conference room. Anything that has more than like 10 people in it, there's a conference room. What proportion of them have video conferencing equipment? Well, maybe now it's 2% by now, but it's still a tiny proportion of conference rooms. And maybe now we're up to, you know, 3 or 4% of homes have webcams or something, or at least ever use them. Maybe more have them in the closet somewhere. So mass acceptance of video has never really occurred, despite absolutely huge consumer enthusiasm. There's no question, there's lots and lots of interest. And despite good technical solutions, tr traditional problems. And I think the reason is that the quality of experience that you get when using video, the way we implement it today, falls short. The sense of being there is not like what people expect. In fact, when you're using video communications today, the sense of distance between yourself and the party on the other end is actually greater the awareness of distance is greater when you're using video than when you're not using video. Okay. And I believe the reason of this, for this is that we are savannah apes with highly adapted interpersonal reflexes. My apologies to any creationists in the audience, but, um, but we are animals and we have behaviors like other animals. And video is not just another channel. People talk about text. The channel, audio channel, now there's a video channel, right? No, it's not the same thing. Okay, so, Hook's use of video. This is, again, four years ago. Um, I won't call us a startup anymore. We're three and a half, four years old. But we are a contract research organization and a manufacturer in the biotech industry. A typical contract research contract, $5,000 to $50,000 kind of range. A uh, typical customer will give you somewhere between three and ten of those. So it's fairly big business, uh, a fairly large amount of money with a particular customer. And we have customers all over the world. Maybe 60, 65 percent of our contract research business comes from countries other than the United States. So they're not local. Um, we have you know, customers in basically every continent except for Antarctica and Africa. Um, so you would think that this would be an ideal kind of situation where, where you would want to use video. Uh, we, you know, Hook has a co-founder, myself, with 14 years in the industry. Uh, in 2008, it was necessary to say that we have a broadband internet connection. That's a little bit obvious now. We had Skype and web webcams. We had a polycom video conferencing system, a room conferencing system. The, the boy there is just for scale. Um, so how often do we use video conferencing in our industry? And how often do our customers want to use it with us? Never. Zero. Not once. Not once in four years. Why not? And what can we do about it? That's what I want to talk about. So let me start by um, telling you about a video telephony system. It's kind of an interesting one. Um, here's some technical specs on it. 18 frames a second, progressive scan display, plasma display, pixel aspect ratio was 3 to 2. The image quality was described actually in the New York Times as excellent. The end and latency was fantastic, one millisecond. Obviously not including uh, propagation delay, but great, right? We can't build a system today like that. Here it is. April 1927, Bell Laboratories. This is um, often considered the first television. The first, yeah, first television. Um, 
Here's the big demo. This guy is Herbert Ives. He was the, the brain behind the thing. Here's Walter Gifford on the thing, president at the time of AT&T in New York, talking with Herbert Hoover, Secretary of Commerce at the time in Washington, D.C., on the video phone. Big deal. Television at that time, the term meant telephone plus vision, right? You already had a telephone, now you're adding vision to it, so you get television. The thing had a 50 by 50 pixel display, 2,500 pixels, neon bulbs, well, plasma, okay. Camera was an arc lamp beam with mechanically scanned, NIPCO disk type of thing. Um, it had optional projection to two by three feet for the display. Uh, Wall Street Journal said the results weren't so good when you blew up those 25 pixels that, 2,500 pixels that big. Here's Edna May Horner, the operator, setting up the call in front of the, the phone. So AT&T was, uh, was interested in this very early. Of course, AT&T, uh, through most of the 20th century, was the monopoly telephone operator in the United States. Uh, here is a uh, cover from Talk Magazine, January 1957, talking about a picture phone. Here's a Bell Labs experimental model that works. Uh, it's a ways in the future. Da -da 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 -da. You can go through stuff. And it's supposedly working. It doesn't look very realistic somehow, but at any rate, AT&T was really interested. And by the early 60s, they were building real, real prototypes. Um, it was called the Picture Phone Project. Here, here's one. Notice the, uh, the aspect ratio is in portrait because they wanted to show portraits of people, right? So you use portrait mode. Um, here's one. This actually wasn't at and this, this one was uh, BT Labs in the UK. Notice the mirror on top. Uh, the mirror is there, of course, so you can tell whether you're, you're framed and whether you're on camera or not. Clever, simple solution. And at and was extremely serious about this. And again, by the 1960s, at and still had their monopoly. They didn't have to worry about price. They didn't have to worry about expense too much. And at and Bell Labs in the 60s was the place where all the bright people were, all the top minds of the, of the technical world. I mean, you know, you go to the cafeteria and lunch was served by a Nobel laureate. Um, plenty of smart business people. They didn't just do things, you know, without thinking about it. Uh, by 1964, they introduced service with the Mod 1 picture phone. Here it is. And now you can see as well as talk, touch tone controls. Attended service between New York, Washington, and Chicago began in 1964. By 1969, they had the Mod 2, which is here. You notice now they've gone to a more square aspect ratio screen. They, they already figured out that there's, there's a problem here. They didn't realize how big the problem was. But. Uh, so talking about framing, here's an ad. Of course, when you have the model in the advertisement, it looks great. Here's a more typical use of what it really looks like. The, the boy's chin is cut off. And of course, from the far end point of view, probably the only person on screen is, is the kid in the middle. The parents are probably not in the, the picture at all. Uh, AT&T was not alone. There was lots and lots of investment. There's lots of market research or lots of usability studies. Here's NTT with the model from 1968. Here's Philips in 74. They were kind of late in the game. Um, AT&T quietly gave up in the late 70s, in the early 70s. Here's a, a picture from a fairly recent trade magazine. It says, the Bell System picture phone rang flat with consumers because it cost too much. Was that really the problem? Did it cost too much? Was AT&T's business analysis of customer demand and cost really that far off? Um, moving on to the 80s, still image picture phones were introduced by the Japanese consumer electronics industry. I remember seeing them in the stores. Um, they used a regular POTS phone line with a modem. Uh, you pushed a button and it took about five seconds to send a single black and white frame, no audio during the transmission. Uh, they thought these would sell like hotcakes and everybody would want them. Does anybody even remember these? Okay, one or two people remember them, good. So, I tried hard a few years ago to find pictures of these on the web and was unable to. That tells you how obscure they were. 1992, at and still at it. They introduced the Videophone 2500. Here's Newsweek magazine, January 20th, 1992. Predicting that 10 years from now, video phones will be as popular as cordless phones and fax machines. Last week, at and introduced the first full color video phone that operates over regular phone lines. They weren't alone. Marconi and others had similar products. Here it was. I, I remember seeing this at the trade show when it was introduced. Uh, it was very unimpressive. 
Um, but since then, there have been a lot of more video phones introduced. They all worked, technically. This was the Siemens T-View in 1997. This was an ISDN phone at 128 kilobits a second. Picture quality was pretty good. This, is, this was a nice one. I used that one. Um, their makers all expected commercial success. People don't go into manufacturing a product like, like this without expecting to, to sell some and make some money. And why shouldn't they? I mean, consumers are consistently excited at the idea of video telecommunication. If you tell them you're going to offer this, they say, yeah, I really want that. So maybe, maybe you're thinking the technology wasn't ready. Maybe that was the problem. Maybe it was too expensive. Maybe the video quality wasn't good enough. Maybe there wasn't enough bandwidth. Maybe the time is right now. Maybe your company or some company you know of is thinking about introducing a video phone. Maybe you think now is the time. Well, if so, you're not alone. A lot of people have introduced video phones. Quite a lot. More than you might think. A lot more. <laughs> I haven't updated this since 2008. I could get another three or four slides out of this if I went online now. None of these are duplicates. These are all separate. So today, of course, video phones are in every home and every office, right? Video calling has replaced voice calling. No. Why not? People want video communication. Witness all the attempts. Just talk to the potential users. There's lots and lots of excitement. But they don't buy it, or if they get it for free, as they do with a cell phone these days, or Skype, if you, that's pretty much free. Uh, they don't use it when it's offered, except for narrow niche applications. People do use the niche applications. For some reason, people are disappointed. When they try it, they think this is neat, and then they never use it again. And we need to understand why before we can fix it. I, I've always believed that you know, understanding the right, asking the right question is 80% of the, solving any problem. So, progress so far, okay. Again, this talk was aimed at the video conferencing industry. Uh, these numbers are from four years ago. Uh, at that time, the conferencing industry was maybe $2 billion a year, generously, maybe half of that, hardware, half services. Uh, it doesn't seem to be growing much. Telepresence certainly has been, been coming on strong. Uh, back then, it was $100 million a year. I have no idea what it is now. Um, but it's expensive, and that limits the market size. Uh, so video conferencing has been offered to an organization since the mid-'80s, more than, well, 25 years now. Uh, it has certainly been more successful than video phones. And I think this is because, it's a, first of all, it's a high-value application. People use it when having video and, and adding something to the conversation is important. Uh, they give you, compared to a video phone, relatively big picture with relatively high re resolution, which means there's less restriction on where people are in the frame. It is more like being there than a video phone. But I think most of all, it's used at work. People are paid to use it. Okay? If people don't really choose to use it. But, okay, here's some numbers. Now, this is from 2008. This was actually, I, I found this a couple of weeks before I pre prepared these slides back then. Um, here's the percent of internet traffic on different applications. And, and ignore everything after 2008. This is, these are just kind of bullshit projections. But 2008 numbers are real. OK, so peer-to-peer, 44%. Online video, you know, watching YouTube, stuff like that, 25.3. Online video, 6.2. Uh, web, 20%. Gaming, 3.5%. VoIP, 1.1%. Video communications, 0.7%, dead last. And as we all know, video is a bandwidth hog, right? So that's pretty small. Even, even then, with these ridiculously um, optimistic forward projections with these, these curves that you always get, there <laughs> wasn't a lot of optimism uh, that it was going to get much better. Um, so after 20 years plus 25, video is in less than 1%, maybe now it's 2% of conference room. So the good news is there's lots of room for growth in that market. But I think uh, similar problems as stopped video telephony have stopped uh, video conferencing. So people want, yeah, please, yeah. What did you mean by PTP? Peer to peer, uh, file sharing mostly. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm assuming, you know, I just found this online somewhere, but I assume that's what they mean. Uh, piracy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's not all piracy, it's just most piracy. Okay. And these numbers came ultimately from Cisco, for what it's worth. Um, so people want 
want video communication. So, so why? Why hasn't this taken off the way everybody expected? So you know, challenges today, okay, or challenges in 2008, and these have changed a little bit. Certainly there's problems with incompatible protocols and standards. You know, uh, you know, Apple has their thing that doesn't talk to the ITU thing, that doesn't talk to Skype and so forth. Um, NATs and firewalls certainly uh, have been a problem, although uh, that's mostly a problem in organizations. It's not such a big problem at home. Network fra fragmentation is not such a big deal now as it used to be because it, m pretty much everything has moved to IP. Um, but uh, still, there's no public automatic gateways between, and bridges between these different incompatible standards. And certainly, there's too much latency in the systems, and there's a lot of denial about that. People, you know, they can't solve it, so they just say it's not a problem, but that doesn't mean it's not a problem. Uh, so that doesn't help. Uh, video phones didn't have connectivity problems, mostly. Early video phones solved this. Uh, they were operated and offered by carriers. They were simple analog devices. They worked. They were compatible. The picture phone was compatible. Uh, video phones were utterly reliable. Uh, the POTS models used the voice network with modems. Reliability wasn't the problem. Connectivity wasn't the problem. So maybe it's cost, okay? Well, AT&T spent the modern equivalent of billions of dollars on a picture phone project. They did lots and lots of market research. This was going to be a major overhaul of the entire global network to support this. They designed the T1 line to support video phones. Um, they had the best and brightest people in the world, both on the business side and the technical side. They were sure this was going to sell. This was going to be the next generation of telephony. Um, there are many free services out there. You need a PC and a $15 webcam, and you can, you can do video calls. Right? You can do Skype and AIM, Yahoo, Messenger, NetMeeting, all those things. They work. They, some of them work quite well. Um, it's not cost, I think, that's been the issue. Uh, of course, many video phones were offered by carriers with subsidies. Phones under $300 were common. Usually, the, there was no surcharge because they wanted to promote it. So, so I'm, I'm thinking the problem probably wasn't cost. I think that, that picture of the Bell video, picture phone saying that it died because of cost probably wasn't the real answer. Um, is it ease of use? Well, the picture phone was a telephone. You pick it up, you dial the number. How hard is that? Uh, most video phones are still that way. So I don't think it's ease of use. It's a video quality. Well, many products today have very good video quality. Even bad pictures look good on small displays. The 60s analog phones had pretty good quality. They were black and white, but they were pretty good. Modern video conferencing systems have excellent video quality. Many of them are HD now. Large displays, they still haven't gotten past that 1% or 2% of, of conference rooms. The phones of the 60s and 70s were, were analog. They didn't have any more latency, really, than a phone call. Uh, probably less than today's phone calls, which are all digital. Um, so I don't think latency was the problem. Not that these things are unimportant. Okay? All of these things are very important. They're necessary. But they don't seem to be sufficient. So today, video conferencing, it's a successful niche. It's an industry, at least. Uh, but it's very far from mass adoption. Video telephony hasn't succeeded. Clearly, there's a desire, though, in the marketplace. I don't think current issues, all those things I just went through, explain why all these things have failed in the past. Standards and connectivity were solved for video phones. Latency wasn't a problem in analog days. So what is, what is the issue? Why haven't users embraced video telephony? Well, you could look at fiction. And fiction has a long history of looking at, at uh, video communications. And fiction certainly creates expectations. This is a frame from Metropolis in 1926. You can see conversation on the video phone there. By the way, notice that the, uh, the sight line here, this guy is looking sort of not in the right direction. Um, but more importantly, fiction reflects expectations. Here we have Jane Jetson talking with her friend on the beach somewhere, sitting on a beach blanket in 1962. And um, it's interesting that if you look at the sight lines here, you can see they are looking at each other. And that's because this was drawn by an artist rather than constructed with film and, and all the technical complications. And so the artist can make anything happen he wants just by drawing in what he wants. And you can tell, even though the, the resolution is terrible here, you can tell roughly that they're looking at each other. You can certainly see which direction her eyes are looking. You can't see which direction her eyes are looking. You can see which way her face is pointing. And they're looking at each other. Where are the cameras? Okay, forget about Jane, okay? We can, we can 
imagine where the cameras might be for her. What about her friend on the beach? Where's the camera? About 20 feet. <laughs> okay. This is impossible. Okay. We can't do this. But it's what consumers expect. And the fact that the artist drew it this way tells you that this is what consumers expect. Okay. In video, we always have perfect framing, perfect lighting. Okay. 1967. Um, in video, in fiction, nobody's nervous on camera. Nobody's worrying about, you know, oh, do I look okay? And no, no, no. Actors always look straight into the camera. There's professional cin cinematography and videography. There's multiple camera positions and zooms and cuts and directors to choose the best shots. Okay? It, everything looks great um, in fictional video. But real video is not like fictional video. Fictional video is fake, but it reflects the expectations of users. And sometimes it offers ideas because artists are often smarter about this kind of stuff and, and TV designers and movie set designers are often more intuitive about this stuff than scientists and engineers are. So what will it take for mass adoption? I think it will take more than just cost, control, latency, reliability, connectivity, resolution, picture size, ease of use, all of these are necessary, but they do not seem to be sufficient. So what is it? I think it's something I'll call quality of experience. The sense of being there is disappointing. People expect something and they don't get it. Whatever they get, it's whatever it is, somehow it's not enough. The, the sense of awareness of distance is actually greater when you're using video than when you're on the telephone. And I'm going to talk about why. So video conferencing is not enough like being in the same place. You don't have eye contact. You don't have peripheral vision. You don't have depth perception. You're worried about framing. Am I in the picture? Am I not in the picture? Perceived distance can be completely wrong. Okay? You, you very often people set up the display at the far end of the conference room and everybody else is sitting around the table. So that person on the video is way, way, way from everybody else. Problems with interruption, that's usually a function of, of latency. You can't interrupt. Okay? Certainly there's other things too, but at least these issues. Okay? So video is much harder than it seems to be. Video is not just another channel like text and audio and video. For text, you can put the keyboard anywhere you want. Farin can't tell. Doesn't matter. Comes out the same. Microphone location doesn't matter very much. Yeah, maybe there's a little more echo or a little a little more background noise one place or another, but you can still have a conversation no matter where you put the microphone. But where you put the camera matters. Okay? Each person in a real conference room has a different viewpoint. People direct their gaze at each other. People can tell when they're being looked at. Okay? Viewpoints matter. Okay? Look at this picture again. Okay? I'm going to leave it up just for a couple seconds so you can study it. Okay, because I think you can learn a lot about what consumers expect to get from video communication from this picture. Okay, first of all, Mr. Spacely, who's the boss here, is much larger than George Jetson in the picture. And that's because Mr. Spacely is the boss. You can tell by the Hitler mustache. Okay. Some people say I have a slight resemblance to Mr. Spacely. That's why I don't wear the mustache. Um, now, I think you can tell from Jetson's reaction that he's not really thinking about whether he's in the frame. He's not really worrying about whether, whether Spacely can see him, okay? even though he's jumped out of his seat. Okay? Now, Mr. Spacely is, appears to Jetson to be very close to him at a confrontational distance. If I come up to somebody and I say, Jetson, right? That's a confrontational kind of <laughs> approach. Um, he's not at the opposite end of a room. Okay? This is why he's jumped out of the seat. Ah! Right? Boss is upset. Okay? Now, Mr. Spacely's image is above Jetson. He's looking down on him. And you can tell, of course, not only from the picture, but look at, look at his eyes. Okay? Spacely is the boss. Bosses are up high. Kings are up high. Judges are up high. People of power like to be in high position. They look to, like to look down on you. And if you're a supplicant, you're looking up. Okay? Now we expect that Spacely here has peripheral vision. We would expect that. If we were standing in the room here together with, with Jetson and we were off to one side like 
where it's drawn from. We expect that if Spacely's eyes were pointed toward us, he would be able to see us, right? And we can tell who Spacely is looking at, right? Look at his eyes. They have eye contact. We can tell. Can you tell with current video who somebody is looking at? I don't think so. We, the viewer, don't have eye contact with either of them. Okay? They are looking at each other, not at us. And we can tell. Okay? This is obvious. Again, you can barely see. Look how little resolution you have in that picture of Jetson's eyes. But the human brain is very, very good at detecting direction of gaze. Incredibly good. There are good evolutionary reasons for that. Because if you weren't good at that, you didn't live long or find mates. Okay? If we were in the room, this would all feel very natural. The artist knows all this without being told. Video engineers, unfortunately, don't. Okay? Viewpoints and perspectives. Um, image size matters. Display distance matters. Okay? And they depend on each other. They're interdependent. And they depend on the type of conversation. Okay, some, some conversations are very formal, distant. Others are very intimate and close. Okay, camera height matters, like I was saying a moment ago. Uh, above, if your face is above the camera, you will appear dominant, like Mr. Spacely. Okay? But there's no single right answer. People can move around. People can stand up. They can sit down. There's multiple viewers in different positions in a conference room. Some of them are up high. Some of them are sitting. Right? It's hard. Framing. Okay? Um, I'll just play the video clip. Hope this comes out because we'll see. More to the left, Mom. I can't see you. I can see you. Yes, but that doesn't mean I can see you. You had it right before. Honey, why don't they put the camera right where you are? And that way, I won't have to move all over the place. Just move to the left. Honey, John is here. Honey, I'm not sure where the camera is. Of course you do. It's the same phone. Just, just move to your right. Come, come, oh, that, that, that's your lap. Mother, mom, stay there. That's good. Hold it. Just stay right there. That's fine. Don't move. But good enough. Okay. So, point made, I guess. That was Rob Morrow and and Debbie Reynolds in uh, Mother, a uh, lousy movie, but. I like the clip, and I apologize for the rough edits. That's my fault. Um, in film and television, which is what we're all used to when we see video, directors choose the right shot. And they change shots to focus your attention on what you're supposed to be paying attention to. Okay? Just like in a real conversation with real people, you move your eyes, you move your head, and you pay attention to different people at different times. Okay? That doesn't happen in today's video systems. Whoops, wrong button. Okay? So even having to think about framing, can be very distracting, as, as was just illustrated. Okay? You want it to be loose enough for freedom of movement. You don't want to have to be in one place. You want to be able to feel natural. But at the same time, you need to have enough detail and enough size to see faces clearly. And it's hard to have both at the same time. Now, this has been pretty much achieved with today's telepresence systems. I think um, things like Skype still don't, don't really do it, although they work okay for just, just one person. If there's more than one person at each end, it's a problem. Uh, perceived inter interpersonal distance is an issue. Here's, here's a, a, a pair of people who look like they're having some kind of intimate, close conversation. Here's a couple of people who look a little more formal. Um, it's very important. People adjust their interpersonal distance depending on what kind of conversation they're having. If they get too close, they feel crowded. If they get too far, they feel distant. And this is controlled both by the size of the image and the distance of the image. And the, but again, the problem is the right distance varies by the type of conversation. There's no single right answer. Okay? And there's some cultural dependence as well. Some cultures just naturally have a closer distance than others. So, more stuff to worry about. Peripheral vision. Who's there? Who's in the room? Who's looking at us? Who's paying attention to us? Who's paying attention to the conversation? Who's drifting off? Who's trying to interrupt? Side conversations. How do you whisper in somebody's ear and say, eh, well, we, should, we should bring something up? Depth perception, okay? And of course, you can do it by focus, you can do it by parallax. Okay? We are animals. We are not machines. We are savanna apes evolved to live in tribes of 50 to 300 individuals, okay? That's still what we are. A lot of social 
problems that we have, I think, come from the fact that we are evolved to live in an environment very different than the one we actually live in. Um, our interpersonal communication skills are highly adapted for that environment. It was critical for our ancestors to correctly assess subtle interpersonal cues in order to survive and reproduce. Is this person going to attack you or are they going to be your friend? Are they going to trade with you? Are they going to lure you in and kill you, right? Are you going to get a mate? Are you going to have children or not? We do not have channels or pipes or ports like machines do, okay? Visual communications is not just another channel. It's something fundamentally different. Okay, so now the last part where I kind of wave my hands and hope. Why is all this so hard? Voice telephony doesn't have these problems, right? People use that all the time. People like it. It's very successful. So why does adding video to something that's already successful make things worse? Because people evolved to talk in the dark. That's why. We have this natural evolved ability to communicate with each other in darkness. And so when we're on the phone, where we are, is in the dark. And that feels natural because that's something we're evolved to do. This is why if you close your eyes when you're on the phone, it feels more intimate. It feels like you're having a more intimate conversation than if you open your eyes. Okay, because that's be like being in the dark. So, what do we do about this? Well, I, I think the fundamental problem has been that Engineers and scientists, and in, in that group, I, I include myself. Yeah, please. Do you have evidence to that statement that you made? On which the one? Like, which, which statement are you talking about? The one about people speak more comfortably in the dark. Okay, the question is, do I have evidence for that statement? I do not. I only have personal experience. Uh, I think most of people uh, have had different types of conversations on the phone in their life. And if you have, you know, if you're away on a trip, and you have a long conversation with your spouse or something on the phone, it feels a lot more intimate if you close your eyes. Yeah? I'm sorry? You know, in the, in the internet age, it would be relatively easy to conduct a survey. Have you conducted a survey about Yes, it would be perhaps, well, I don't know exactly how you measure how, how intimate things are, I don't know, but you can, you can get their self-assessment, yeah. Certainly you could, and that would be very interesting to do. But this is, this is my opinion, and it's based on personal experience. Yeah, please. So do you have any market data or some studies to show that this quality of experience may lead to mass adoption? question is, do I have any market experience, any market data to show the quality of experience will lead to mass adoption? Absolutely not. None whatsoever. Um, this is opinion. This is my opinion based on 14 years in the conferencing industry and observing what people do. So, uh, I believe that TV and film designers, at least the good ones, uh, are very often much more creative people than scientists and engineers. And I include myself in that group of scientists and engineers, not the creative ones. They often have better intuitions about people and how people will act. Uh, they're, they're not nerds like us, right? Um, so I think a study of what they've done in science fiction would probably be worthwhile. I don't think it will solve all the problems, but it, you might learn something. Uh, I think some of this, the examples I showed today, I think you could learn something from. Um, however, Sturgeon's Law, of course, still applies. Everybody knows what Sturgeon's Law is, right? Who knows what Sturgeon's Law is? Please. Any sufficiently advanced technology is... No, that's Clark's Law. <laughs> it's 99% uh, of everything is bullshit. Yeah, 90% of everything is crap. 99, isn't it? No, it's 90%. <laughs> <laughs> How many percent is that? In? I was <laughs> trying to prove that statistic. Yeah, yeah. I, okay, well. <laughs> okay, just anyway, so. All right, I, I think we need a new research project. <laughs> <laughs> to really, uh, okay, so uh, here's, here's, to boil all this down, okay, here's what I think a necessary, perhaps not sufficient, but a necessary condition of success is. And I will make a prediction. No system for video conferencing, video telephony, telepresence will enjoy mass market adoption and use until it is possible to point with a finger at a particular person or thing on the far end. And by that I mean if I'm with a group of people on one end of a video call in, in Boston, and there's another group of people at the far end, at the other end in Redmond, and one person in Boston points at another person in Redmond, everybody on both sides should know who's being pointed at. 
If you can do that, which we can't today, I think you'll have gone a long way towards solving the problem. <laughs> I think there's ways short of a Hollywood deck of doing it. Mm -hmm. I have some half-baked ideas. So, so we'll I'm not the only one who has half-baked ideas. Half -baked so, ideas. <laughs> so as I say, I think this is a necessary condition for success. It may not be sufficient. There may be other problems as well. But I think if you can't do that, you're not going to crack the mass market. Uh, one way of approaching this is using virtual camera viewpoints. And a virtual camera is where you have usually two or three, or sometimes four or more, uh, cameras spaced out in different locations and then you synthesize a view somewhere in between the, the limits described by those cameras. There's some very nice uh, YouTube videos up posted by this guy Oliver Kralos at UC Davis who I don't know who has been doing it uh, using a Kinect to get depth information uh, which is very clever. It's not a new idea to do these kind of virtual camera viewpoints. I saw people doing it. I, I saw actually a demo of it working uh, back around 2003 at Fraunhofer in Berlin. Uh, then it was done purely by video. Uh, I remember seeing it done back in the 80s at MIT uh, on still pictures. They didn't have the, the processing to do video in those days. But, so it's not a new idea, but using Connect that makes it a lot more practical, a lot easier, which is neat. Um, if you go to my blog, um, there's links to those videos, and, and I talk a little bit more about it there. Um, Despite my admiration for, for what, what he's doing and this, this approach, I do have a sneaky suspicion, honestly, mostly based on my, uh, my experience of the demo at Fraunhofer, that this may not work by itself. Uh, and I think the issue is that the position and angle of the iris, of the eye, is absolutely critical for getting eye contact to work. And simply synthesizing a video, a virtual viewpoint may not solve that problem. However, I gave this talk many times, and at one point, I wish I could take credit for this idea. I can't. I don't know who, whose idea it was, but somebody in the audience said, hey, why don't you process the video and move the position of the iris in the video? I think that's a really neat idea, and I'd love to see somebody work on that. Um, so what does the market really want? They want telepresence. They want the real thing, like being there. And today's telepresence, like the systems you can buy today, certainly are an improvement over what we had before. Picture size and quality are clearly enough. Peripheral vision and framing are pretty much solved. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's expensive. But it's still not like being there. The awareness of distance is still greater than it is on the phone. Um, but even, although you know, a tiny fraction of the potential market is being served, even small improvements can make a big difference. And if you can get from 1% to 2%, well, you've doubled your market, right? So you don't have to solve the problem all at once. You can solve it incrementally and make money along the way. So I think there's a big innovation opportunity here. The telepresence market is great because it's not cost sensitive. You can spend lots of money on fancy hardware if you will really get something about it, something useful out of it. And of course, the technology always trickles down to cheaper systems later. So it doesn't have to be perfect. So how do you get there? Um, this is my opinion. You get there by prototyping. You, you try lots and lots of ideas. You tinker around, you experiment. We all have ideas, and we all think our untested ideas will work. But very few new ideas actually work. Um, and so we have to be a little bit humble and say, you know, rather than committing to some untried idea and rolling out a product, uh, we've got to try it first in, in a prototype. So I say you build lots of prototypes, you test them cheaply, you build prototypes and not products. Uh, products. There's a few of them. Prototypes, hopefully, there's many. Products are usable by anybody. Prototypes are usable only by their builders. Products have to be reliable. Prototypes can be clunky. Products have to be interoperable. Prototypes have, can be unique. Products have to be cheap because they're made in volume. Prototypes can be expensive because you're only going to build a couple. You can run them manually. Um, so, you know, my advice is to take some risks, but take risks that you can afford. Most new ideas are no good. But if you're not doing something risky, you're not doing real innovation. So parting advice, try something new. Don't repeat past failures like those 400 video phones I showed you. Find ways to seek improvement instead of uh, getting depressed because you can't get perfection. Tinker around. Don't theorize. Prototype. Don't commit. Use off-the-shelf technology because that lets you do lots of prototypes. Don't try to get the last end tenth of a percent of performance. Listen to end users. 
don't listen to customers. That's a huge mistake that the video conferencing industry makes, is that the people who buy the products are not the same as the people who use the products. Listen to your users and not your customers. Lead the market, don't follow the competition. Focus on the unserved 99%, not the 1% that's already an existing market. Someone will get there eventually. And why not you? So thank you. So how much time do I have left? I'll, I'll take questions. I got nine minutes, I guess, something like that. Yeah, please. Uh, so you keep saying that uh, phone is better. The experience of the phone is better than a video. Uh, in some ways. Have you ever participated in a one hour phone meeting with five people? I have, many times. And was that better than a video? It, it depends on what kind of, of conference it is. Yeah, certainly there are if you have a one hour meeting with five, five people, as you say, in a conference call, video is very often better than audio only. No question about it. But in the kind of calls most people make most of the time, which are one-on-one, -on -one, pick up the phone, you call somebody. Have you ever made a one-on-one, one-hour long phone conversation? Of course. I'm 50 than... years old. I've made quite a few phone calls by now. <laughs> <laughs> no, because my, my experience is like phone calls are better if you just want to say something. So. If I call someone and say, hey, can you go I mean, it's like a one minute conversation, that's better. Um, I do have regular meetings with people, and they are always on video. It's just much better um, for longer conversations. So if it's a one hour interaction, then you're picking. Okay, so l let me just repeat the question so uh, it gets picked up. So the, the question is, you know, have I been in the experience of hour long meetings with five people or hour long? meetings with one people on the phone versus on video and, and which is better. Um, obviously I have. Um, I've done it both ways. And there are times when video is certainly better, particularly if it's a long meeting with people that you don't know terribly well um, and where it's easy to kind of drift off and kind of not pay attention to the conversation, let the other people in the conversation take over. And video is, is, is good because video helps keep your attention. It lets you look at people. Um, there's other times when it's clearly worse. But I think if you look at the experience in the marketplace and you look at uh, how people actually use video when they have the ability to use video and you look at uh, people's behavior uh, when they have the option, you'll find that people use video for very narrow niche applications. Um, okay, here in the audience is, is my stepson. Uh, he's in college. When he's in college, we made a few Skype calls uh, so we could talk to him and see how he's doing. We did it two or three times, and then we never did it again, right? And um, I think it's very typical. People get this stuff, they get excited about it, they use it a few times until the kind of the novelty wears off and then they can't be bothered. Uh, there are exceptions. There are certainly people who talk with their relatives who are in other countries and they use video and they, they find it valuable. Uh, but if you look at the proportion of times people who have the choice to use video actually choose to use it, it's very, very small. So when you do talk to him on the phone, how long is the conversation? I don't know. How long is your average? About an hour. So. Yeah, please. Thank you very much for your um the question I have is, I think you touched on it, and I know that telling the late 90s the, the quality of the systems one time has been pretty poor due to either technology and the hardware and codec and also in the, um, the transmission line. Um, and a lot of telcos did a lot of work looking at usability issues around it in terms of scoping out the market. Mm -hmm. And one of the big issues I recall reading about was intrusiveness of video and privacy. Now, do you think that still exists as a barrier? And, or do you think that's actually starting to come down with people having more experience of video conference, through Skype, and so on? OK, so uh, I'll again try to repeat the question. Um, you said in the 90s, uh, the video systems that were available had poor quality, which certainly is true compared to what we have today. Uh, and that there was a lot of research done on intrusiveness of video, and do I think it's still a problem? And the answer is yes, I think it's a huge problem. I think it's, it's another way of stating the same problem that I've been talking about. Uh, by intrusiveness, 
at least the way I'm going to interpret it. Um, what's uncomfortable about being on video is that unlike right here, where uh, there's an audience, there's 20 or 30 people here, um, and I can tell that people are looking at me, and I can tell that other people are looking down at their laptops or something, and I can react appropriately. I control my behavior. I don't pick my nose. Um, I, you know, try to create the kind of impression that I want to create, and we all do this. You're actually dressed. I'm actually dressed. That's right. I'm dressed, and I've been in the desert for a week, and I was wearing shorts and torn T-shirts, and I put on clean jeans and, and a, a shirt. Um, and it's because we can tell when we're being looked at, and we can kind of defend ourselves socially by our behavior that we feel comfortable in a social situation. But when we're on video, we can't tell. Even when everybody's focusing on somebody else, and you're not the speaker, you're just listening, you can't tell if people are looking at you or not. And that's what makes it uncomfortable. Because you kind of have to assume the worst case. You have to assume that they are looking at you all the time. And that's stressful after a while. You can't just be a member of the audience. Okay. So I think, yes, intrusiveness is a huge issue. And if you could solve some of these issues I talked about, it would become less intrusive. Yes, please. Hey, I was uh, curious, of the things you've seen, either products or experiments, what are the ones that you've liked the best lately? Well, honestly, I haven't been paying a lot of attention lately. I've been in the biotech industry. Um, the question was, what is, what is recent stuff do I like the best? Uh, the most interesting thing I've seen lately is, is what I talked about, Oliver, Oliver. Kralos. Uh, only because he's doing virtual camera viewpoints in an a inexpensive and efficient way. Obviously, there's a lot of rough edges still, but um, it looks like I would love to see somebody turn that into a product. As I say, I think uh, it may not solve the problems all by itself, but it would be a good step along the way. Um, other than that, uh, I think you know, HD video is certainly better. More resolution is always good. But I don't think the fundamental problem is resolution anymore. I think it's these other issues. Yeah. Yes, you, you say good things about voice. Well, I work on voice for a long. There are some fundamental problems with the voice, which video can complement, such as when you are talking at the you know, noisy environment, you just have to, you know, to be really you know, squeeze. So that, and at that condi under that condition, you have to just turn into the video the clip. It actually can help you to understand a lot better. So I, before I heard your talk, I always thought that you know the problem, you know, going through your abstract. I always thought that the problem is the ease of use. Right? Every time you want to use a, a video, you know, you have to. I mean, if, you know, in the room, for example, you also have to twist your, you know, position of your camera a little bit to make sure that you are there. So that now uh, hearing your talk, it just struck me that well, that doesn't seem to be the problem. If you, you know, you do things uh, all right. So is that any? Before you saw all these difficult technical problems you mentioned here, you know, pointing finger or otherwise, uh, is there any way that actually somehow use the low end video just in such a way to complement some weakness of the video of, of, of the voice, in such a way that the combination chip combination can give better experience? Okay, so so let me try to summarize the question as I understand it. So you're saying that that audio can have problems where you have trouble understanding things and there can be noise. And you're asking, can video be used to improve comprehension by, um, by, by, yeah. Uh, well, obviously the answer is yes. Um, obviously, you know, just just now as you're asking the question, you know, you're waving your hands, and I can see you waving your hands, and and we don't wave our hands for no reason. We're we're trying to communicate something by doing that. Um, you know, there's a limit to, to how much video can improve comprehension. I mean, if you can see people perfectly well and you still can't hear what they're saying, you're still going to have a problem unless you know sign language. But, um, but um, yeah, certainly can help. And I'm not saying, you know, today's video is useless. Okay, obviously there's an industry there. Uh, there's people who use it. There's people who like it. Um, but what I am saying is that the amount of use and the size of the market is tiny infinitesimal compared to what anybody expected and to what it could be if it worked properly. Okay? That's all I'm trying to say. Yeah, it looks like on a FaceTime, you know, I haven't used that, but I saw some demo FaceTime. Once it becomes available easily, people probably use them more. I, I would use it, you know, if I just turn on. That's what everybody says. Is if, if only I had it and it was convenient, <laughs> I would use it all the time. But you won't. 
you will use it three or four times and then you'll never use it again. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, the US, United States may be an outlier because it has over 100 years of telephones that worked and were available, unlike most of the world. Do other countries differ here? They used to say that half of France is waiting for a telephone line and the other half is waiting for a dial tone. <laughs> okay. And I've seen worse than Okay, is that a question? Yeah, are other countries different? Same here. Um, how do other countries do? Uh, I haven't seen any difference in the things I'm talking about on, on a national basis. I, I have seen video used in many countries around the world, uh, and I don't see any, any differences. Uh, maybe there's some, some place where, where people are different. I, I don't know, but I haven't seen it. Yeah, Toby. Well, I, I'll answer the question over here. I'm on the phone with a dozen people or so, eight to 10 hours a week. And oftentimes, those are 6 or 7 a.m. one hour to 90 minute teleconferences with people in Tokyo and Helsinki, and because you have to schedule them at weird times to get people around the world on the call. And we never use video. And yet, we have very productive calls. Uh, and, and the thing that increases the productivity exponentially is web conferencing. You know, live meeting, WebEx, go to meeting, whatever it takes, because that's what allows us to work very collaboratively and get a lot of work done in a relatively short period of time. Um, I would hate to use video. If, we had, if I had video, I would turn it off. Because you know, at 6 a.m. this morning, I was on such a call, and I was not fully dressed. That's why I made the comment I did. And I can do it in my messy home office, and nobody knows. It's like the old cartoon. You know, when you're on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Right? Yep. And it's exactly the same thing with voice, but that just doesn't work with video. Yeah. I know them all well, and we, the, maybe the, well, part of the difference is that all the people I'm meeting with, we have been in face-to-face -face meetings before. We know what each other looks like from having been in those face-to-face -face meetings, and it's not like we're meeting with them for the first time. Yeah, I, I, I find that interesting. You know, I did video technology standardization for, for a dozen years, and, you know, I was always going off to Geneva and other places, as you know, Tony, Toby, and, you know, the, the typical spouse question is, why do you have to get on an airplane and go to a foreign city in a foreign country for a week and a half in order to talk about video conferencing? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is because it doesn't work yet. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah. So how about the social networks? Do you think social networks are going to drive for mass adoption of video conferencing quickly? Okay, the question was, well, how about social networks where they drive mass adoption of video conferencing? The answer is no. I don't think so. Uh, I think social networks are great, and uh, I think there's a, some element of fad to them, but I think that there's a lot of meat to them as well. And uh, they're great, but I don't think that they will change things fundamentally. I mean, what, one of the issues, as Toby brought up a, a second ago with, with video, is that people are concerned about their appearance. They're concerned about not, not just their physical appearance, but how they are perceived by other people. people we, we all value our social relationships. And we want to be perceived well. We want to be liked. And, and we don't want to be perceived as sloppy or, or inattentive or, or all these things. And a lot of the behaviors that we do so casually on the phone, you know, is we kind of have to listen to somebody while checking our email and stuff like that. We could never do if they were there in person uh, and they could see us not really paying attention to them because, you know, we, we, we try to be polite. And so one of the reasons video is more stressful is because we have to be more on. We have to pay more attention. Uh, and the fact that current video doesn't give us the fundamental um, tools that we're used to having in real life of knowing when people are paying attention to us and when they're not uh, makes it more stressful than a real meeting in person. Because we, uh, as I said before, we have to assume the worst case all the time. Yeah. So do you think there may be more important reason for not having mass adoption than the quality of experience that you talk about? Uh, I think that, yes, it's a, it's, ultimately it's a major reason why people don't use video much is because they, they find it stressful and uncomfortable and it doesn't give them enough in return to compensate for that. But I think if you solve these technical problems that I've been talking about, it would be much less of a concern and much less stressful and it would get used more. Whether it would get used 100% to replace voice, honestly, I doubt it. But I think instead of being, you know, one or 2% of calls, it might be 30 or 40% of calls. How do you know the trend's changing, right? 42% of all Skype calls have video in them now. Yep. Right? So even if 
you know, from 2008, right, the stats are moving in that. And, you know, and even though the barrier to entry is still quite high, um, there's been some research done recently by our hardware group, you know, people will take 10 minutes to set up a video call because they get to talk with their sister's daughter, their ch you know, new baby, right? So it's like, then the, the, the realization of the benefits they're going to get are, are like they're going to put up with a lot of crap, basically. Just yes. So I, like, I do think, and then that other point, it's interesting, I think video is in this no man's land where so you, we're so used to comparing it to voice, but really it's not. It's not good enough to get to be like as good as face to face. So we're going, we're falling back and we're saying, oh, it's just like voice, but it's not. Like we're doing ourselves a disservice. We should try and separate out that, you know, video conferencing is just voice plus video. It's not. It's its own beast unto itself and has some other problems to solve to make it like as good as face to face. Yeah. And then the other comment I wanted to make is that. You know, it is true that people need to figure out that they're on all the time, but don't you think we may evolve and actually get used to being, like, on all the time? Yeah, I, I think if we keep I using can... current video for maybe a million years, we will evolve. It's going to take that long. Because <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> it's just interesting as we look at sort of the generation that's coming on and how used to they're just, like, throwing themselves out there through Twitter, through Facebook, right? There's more of this online presence all the time. I actually don't think it may take a million years. I think it's going to be a little bit quicker. But well, time will tell. Yeah, okay. So I, I can't summarize all of that. It's not a question, it's just more of a All right, but, but uh, yeah, I agree with most of that. And uh, I, I do think there'll be a certain amount of learning involved, and, and things will gradually get better. But uh, I think unless we see a fundamental change in the technology, uh, there's going to be a very definite limit to how much video is used. Of your, you know, yeah. we have to design it. It's an experiential. We're social creatures at the end of the day. So I, you know, I, I buy into your thesis. Okay, yeah, please. So, uh, talking about the intrusiveness of the real video, how do you think about those uh, avatars as a representative? Oh, okay. Uh, that's a good question. The um, question was uh, talking about intrusiveness, what, what do I think about avatars? Um, I think avatars are a neat idea. Um, in some ways, they solve some of these problems with intrusiveness, certainly, but at the same time, they lose many of the advantages that you get from video. You, you don't get facial expressions anymore unless you think to type them consciously, which you, know, you don't do. You don't get uh, subtle clues about who's paying attention and who's looking at whom. And so although avatars don't have many of the problems that video has, um, they also don't have many of the advantages that video has. Uh, so I'm not a, a big av advocate of that. And of course, then there's the, the problem of, of the uncanny valley, right? where if you try to make the avatars look too natural, then they, they look really weird, and people don't like them. So usually avatars are very cartoonish for that reason, and that's, that's probably a good thing. Uh, I, I do kind of like the idea, uh, I'd like to see it tried a little more, of extracting the images of people, uh, the real video captured, optically captured images of people, and placing them in a common virtual environment. And that might be an interesting thing to experiment with. Um, but um, avatars, per se, I'm, I'm not uh, terribly optimistic about. Although, I would say that if, hypothetically, and it's, it would be hard, but it probably could be done, if you could pick up enough details with the video and you could process it and actually analyze facial muscle motion and things like that so that you could actually make the avatars reflect uh, gaze direction and uh, expression and things like that in real time in a natural way, then avatars might, might be interesting. I don't know, you'd have to try it, but uh, it would be a very interesting research project. Yeah, please. Can they try to extract gaze direction and ship it separately from the rest of the image so it gets there with less delay and less inaccur inaccuracy? Uh, not that I've heard of. The question is, has people tried to extract gaze direction? Uh, the answer is not that I've heard of, but I wouldn't be surprised if somebody has done it and I haven't heard of it. Uh, I think that would be very interesting. The, the question is, though, even if you can extract gaze direction, how do you, first of all, it has to be extremely accurate because we can tell even, we can detect even tiny, tiny inaccuracies. And secondly, um, you know, how do you display it on the far end and how do you represent it? Uh, I think, you know, I, I've thought of ways to represent it in some explicit way with an arrow or something, which I don't think would feel very natural. Um, so you can imagine trying to move the irises and things in the image, which, which might work well if it could be done, but I think that would be tricky also. But again, there's lots of, lots of room for, for lots of work here. Yeah, please. In audio, could you comment the, uh, the value of speech audio? The value of speech audio? Spatial, spatial audio. Spatial audio. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I think spatial audio is a great idea. Uh, I, I really like it. I've heard some uh, great demos. And uh, spatial audio does 
uh, give you, you know, it tells you the direction that people are, are coming from. And that's very valuable and it helps you separate things and makes it easier to understand. Um, I don't think that it will work very well in a mix with video unless you can solve these other problems. Because if you have, you know, like this speech coming from this direction but the screen is over there, then I think you're going to have a disconnect. But again, I haven't tried it, so, you know, I, I hesitate to, to say anything very, very strongly on it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I've seen that, and that's good. It's definitely an improvement. I don't think it's a solution, you know, to all the problems, but it's definitely a good thing and an improvement and and valuable. Yeah. One or two other questions. I'll ask one more. Uh, so, how important do you think it is to solve the problem of? of people not being able to look directly at the person they're speaking to because the camera is not in the middle of the screen. And uh, the camera is not co-located with the image of the eyes. Yes. Not and just it, in the middle of the screen. There, That's are not there good ways enough. to solve that problem that you've seen technologically to put the camera behind the screen or something like well, that? Well, many people have tried that. Yeah, many people have built systems where they do place the camera behind the screen, either with various optical tricks and half-silvered mirrors and all kinds of things like that. Um, I've seen many attempts, and, and you know, offline I could tell you as much as I can remember about them, um, but um, they never work very well. Um, I think there's two reasons why they don't work very well. One is that um, just putting the camera in the middle of the screen, which is what everybody I've seen has done, is not accurate enough. We can tell very easily uh, what the difference between looking at your nose and looking at your eyes. Okay? We're just so highly tuned animals to be able to tell the difference. Uh, you know, women can tell when you're looking at their breasts as opposed to their face, right, at huge distances. <laughs> um, so, so that's one problem. The other problem is that all those optical schemes usually add a lot of distance to the optical path uh, between the display and the viewer. And the result is that the image appears to be very far away and not at a natural conversational distance. So.